How you guys doing? You doing, you doing well? well? You're looking, You're looking good. good. Happy Sunday night. night. We're, in We're in a series called The Interrupters, uh, studying, studying the men and women uh, throughout church, church history that brought heaven to earth. And, and um, let me just ask you, by way of survey, survey how many of you have ever been a part of a move of God? You saw incredible things um, happen. Uh, you're, you're like, oh my goodness, this, this is that. that. And, then and then all of a sudden, sudden something happened, happened and, um, and, and it wasn't, wasn't that anymore. anymore. And, and, um, and then all of a sudden you were somewhat embarrassed that you were, that you were even kind of a part of it. Anyone? Anyone? Anyone, anyone, anyone have an experience like that? You're, you're like, like, oh my goodness, I thought it. I thought this was that. And it, and it wasn't all that. that. And, now, and now, how do we get those videos, videos off YouTube? <laughs> how many, how many are, are grateful that there wasn't like a YouTube in the 70s? 80s, 90s. 90s. <laughs> the, the stuff, stuff on the 90s, 90s is now, now making it onto YouTube. YouTube. But, but um, here's, here's the thing. thing. Um, in, our in our series, our first, our first 13 weeks, weeks okay, our, it wasn't quite 13 weeks because we condensed and put some, but our first 13 apostles that we looked at um, it, was it was pretty awesome, awesome because there's only really one apostle that we studied that, that like, was quite, was quite disgraceful. And, and that, that made it easy. easy. That, that, that was that, it, like, like the, ride the ride up to this point, point has been, been quite easy because the people, the people that, we that we have been studying weren't that necessarily perfect, perfect but, but the Lord redeemed them. them. So, so most, most of them started off um, quite, quite ordinary. ordinary. Quite, quite worldly, and then God redeemed, redeemed them, and they finished well, with the, with the exception of Judas. Judas. What's going to make our study, our study interesting? interesting? Not, Not so much in season two, two as we study kind of the the, um, the saints and um, uh, the, the mystic, mystic uh, uh, desert, desert fathers. And, um, there's there's going to be times. Time, time, there's there's going to be these moments where you're like, where you're going to cringe, and you're going to just say, you know, I don't know if I can honor that. And and then, and then when we get into the final season of, of, this, of this thing, we get into the restoration of the gifts within, within the last hundred years. years. Almost every person that, that we honor, there's, there's going to be moments, moments when you when you say, "I don't, I don't, like, I don't know if I like them." them. So, so the, the longer this series goes, the more human these people, people are are going to see. Now they're all human, and and they've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But, but what, what you're going to find is that God uses imperfect people. And what, where it's going to get really difficult is when, is when, is when people, people are in the crux of ministry at the summit of the supernatural, and then, and then they, they do something, something just stupid. stupid. You know, you know, and, you know, you know who's, who's got, got a story like, like that? You know, Noah. Noah, Noah, Noah kind of had a story like that, yeah? yeah? There are, there are biblical, biblical examples that we even, even David had, had had a bit of a had, had a bit of a moment where where, where uh, church, church leadership had to kind of sit him down. <laughs> it's, not it's not funny, funny okay. okay? All right. All right. <laughs> Tonight's, Tonight's going to be probably one of the most difficult studies that we're going to have in this second season as we look at um, uh, the church uh, uh, in, in the. the Early, early stages, stages of our church, church experience, experience. meaning like, like the, the post apostolic era, era getting, getting into um, the, the first 300, 400 years of Christianity, Christianity after the death of Christ. Christ. So, so tonight, tonight guys, we're going to be studying the conversion of Constantine, Constantine which, which takes, takes place in about, uh, we're going to be looking, looking at some, some various dates. dates. Um, uh, uh, we're going to be looking, looking at between 274 to 330 as far as the life of Constantine. So we're going to fast forward a little bit, and then as we get into um, next week's study, um, I'm going to give you just a, a quick little um, look at what we're going to look at uh, next week, because I think this is interesting. We're going to be looking at the dynamic that exists and the tension that exists between the, the supernatural, supernatural and, and the natural, natural or, the or the realm of the spirit and, and the realm of knowledge. knowledge. Uh, I, I love what Kroger said at our conference when he when was he talking about um, kings, kings and priests and, priest, and how kings, kings kill, kill priests. priests. And he talks, talks about this place of this, 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 this um, tension, tension that, that exists between faith 
and knowledge, and knowledge or the things, things of the spirit and the things, things of the natural. Of the natural. So, so next, next Sunday night, night we're, we're going to be looking at Clement of Alexandria, Alexandria and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and his, his ministry between 150 and 215. And, and we're going to be looking at this radical, mystical, mystical dynamic and this one who wrestled to see, to see the things of the spirit and the things of this natural realm held together within a beautiful tension. So that's, so that's what we're going to be looking at uh, next, week, next week. The week after, after that, we're going to be looking, looking at supernatural mothers, mothers because it'll be Mother's Day. Day. And we're going to be looking at uh, Perpetua and Felicity. Uh, they, uh, they, were, uh, they, they lived between 181 and 203. And 203. In, fact, In fact, Perpetua died at 22 years old. And, and that, that is, is a radical, radical supernatural, heart-gripping story of these two supernatural moms and how they laid it down because of their love for, for Christ. And so this is going to be an amazing uh, next, uh, next season to this series as we dive into um, really this, this 100, 200, 300, 400 years into Christianity after Jesus died. We're going to begin tonight in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. You say, Acts chapter 2. Yeah, I'm going to begin here because we're going to have to contrast the early church, okay, with the 12 apostles, with what's going to take place within the church. And to a great degree, we're going to find that we are still railing against a lot of the things that happen in this shift due to the conversion of Constantine and some huge implications on our movement that still affect us to this day. And again, the tension tonight is going to be to honor church history and to honor the sovereignty of God and what he did through this conversion, even though there's going to be times when you are triggered and you might just want to quit this whole thing. <laughs> Don't quit. Love Jesus. Love people. We're going to be okay. All right? History is messy. All right? And, uh, and I just love that we get to, to, to process this as a, as, a, as a community. Okay. You ready? All right. Acts 2, 4, 2. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Okay. And to the breaking of bread, which means they like to eat together. Okay. And to prayer. And awe, okay, the awesomeness, the fear of the Lord came upon every soul and many signs and wonders and miracles were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and their belongings, not just their old phone, iPhones, but <laughs> even their new ones, okay, and distributing the proceeds to any who had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So they've just been baptized in the Holy Spirit. This thing has exploded. We've seen a harvest. We've seen the church go from 120, okay, to 3,000, just like that. And then every day, the Lord is adding to their number. And what are they doing? They're going to temple, okay, where they're honoring their Jewish roots. And, they're, and, they're, and, and then what are they doing? They're like, hey, temple was great. Let's go to Billy's house. All right. right, right, right. And they would all cram into Billy's house, and they couldn't all fit into Billy's house. So they'd, some of them would go to Sarah's house. She lived on the lake anyway. She had the nicer house. So some of them would go to Sarah's, and they'd go to each other's homes, and they would, they would eat pizza, and they would drink non-alcoholic wine, you know, and they would just, and they would be together, and then someone would say, hey, I, I'm feeling the Holy Spirit. I need to confess sin. I have, I have sinned against God and against our community, and they would confess sin to each other, and then they would forgive each other and love each other. Then they would take communion together. Then the next day, they would go to work. Then they'd go to temple, and they'd say, whose house are we going to go to tonight? 
we're going to go to the Seton's house. All right. And everybody would go to the Seton's house. And then Jane would pour alcoholic wine. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. All right, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. And they would, and they would eat um, shrimp fettuccine Alfredo. They would be together. And someone would say, I want to I wanna share a miracle that I saw Jesus do. And, I, I, and, and I, I brought a friend tonight who's not yet a believer. And they would love the person. And then, you know, and this is what they would do. This was, it says, and they would eat together with gladness of heart. And they would fellowship each other. And they would, they would love each other. And they would confess sin to each other. And the Lord did by day added to their number. This was the program. The program is they just love God and they just love each other and apparently they really love food. They were just always eating. And I love the fact that it says, you know, they're selling their possessions, but they ate good food and they ate it with gladness of heart. I dig this church, you know? What do you guys do? We eat a lot of food and we do it together. Praise the Lord. And this is all prior to a great shift that we experienced within the Christian church. During this time, Christianity is spreading everywhere. In fact, um, scholars during this time and commentators would say that the church was spreading like wildfire. And if you were Roman, you would see this thing actually spreading like a cancer. And by 300 AD, Christians were literally... Now, this is, this is pretty wild. This, this is the, um, the emperor, uh, Diocletian, and he got very... Frustrated. Diocletian, he was an emperor before, uh, before Constantine. And all of these emperors, all of these Roman emperors were radically spiritual. They were very spiritual and they were very supernatural. These guys had oracles that they would consult with. That when it came to a battle, it was always about consulting with the oracles. It was all about consulting with the gods. You had to make sure that the gods were happy with you. And it's very interesting that during this time, by 300 AD, the emperors were literally frustrated because the Christians were jamming up their demonic radar. The oracles were unable to function because the Christians were jamming up the spiritual airways. There's a story of Diocletian. He is in, uh, 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 I'm trying to remember where, where, he's, where he was at. Um, uh, anyways, it doesn't matter. He was consulting with this oracle, and this oracle cut open an animal. It was going to use the innards of the animal to tell the future. And so he begins taking out the intestines, and he's going to read the intestines. And as he does, he says, these intestines, you know, you know, and, and, and the oracle basically looks at these things, and he's like, well, this is a bloody mess. Like, the oracle is like, their intestines. And they're saying, they're saying, what do they say? And there was a major pivotal war, and, and decisions need to be made. And they're looking at these things, and, and the, the oracle is like, I can't tell you. And that's when Diocletian realized that there must be Christians either in that room or Christians in their high ranks. And this is what triggers a major Christian persecution. That leading up even to Constantine, we see unprecedented Christian persecution. Here's a quote from Emperor uh, Diocletian where he says, The immortal gods will be well disposed and favorable to the name of Rome if we scrutinize thoroughly everyone under our rule and see they properly cultivate in every way a pious, observant, peaceful, and chasteful life. 
Rome would be saved through a baptism of blood, a sacrifice of Christian blood. And we begin to see Christians martyr. In fact, during this time, uh, 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 they came up with the most heinous. Uh, they would have these massive claws that they, would, that they would make out of metal, that they would just claw these Christians. They would do crucifixions in Colosseums. So literally, Christians would be crucified as wild animals and cheetahs are are actually um, uh, uh, eating these eating these these people. Um, uh, Rome. They tried to find up, find, come up with the most elaborate and symbolic ways of not just killing Christians, but making an example out of them as a form of worship to their false deities. They believe that the more shame they could bring upon a Christian, the more pleasure they could fill their God's heart with. So we will worship our gods through the shaming, through the most excruciating torch, and, and, and you're, you're, the stories of people being ripped apart. And even as we get into the weeks as we go ahead, uh, leading up to the conversion of Constantine, we're going to be reading of these incredible, radical, supernaturalists who God uses, but they face excruciating, violent deaths, but they do it with joy. They do it with total joy. So we see Diocletian um, uh, with this incredible uh, persecution. And, um, uh, 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 and, and it was this idea that as we purge the Roman Empire of Christians, that we will win the favor uh, of our gods. And at a certain point in time... Rome started to feel a little bit guilty about this. And they actually, believe it or not, believed that they had crossed a line. And so they began to pull back on the persecution. So just before the conversion of Constantine and just before Constantine's reign, what they would actually do is they would do these little things. So instead of killing Christians, they would, for example, they would gouge out the right eye of a believer. So that whenever you'd see somebody, you would immediately know if they were a Christian. So they would do these things. They would remove an arm, gouge out an eye. And then before you know it, you'd see all these people around town with only one eye, a left eye. So very, very fascinating time. It's a time of war. It's a time of betrayal. It's a time of the emperors. In fact, just before Constantine uh, takes the throne, we see many successions. We see... Um, corruption within Rome. And so uh, this brings us to Constantine. Um, Constantine, to make a long short story short, um, was an emperor um, uh, during a very confused series of inheritance and squabbles and military battles. Oftentimes when we think of an emperor or as a king um, uh, stepping into a place of the throne, we think of a king that hands uh, his kingdom over to his son. You have a king, you have a prince. Rome was not ruled this way. When Constantine's father uh, uh, died, Constantine was recognized only by some to be the new emperor, but only of the western half of the Roman Empire. His rival for this claim was Maxentius, and in 312, Constantine marched on Rome to oust him and to take over the entire kingdom. When he was en route, he had a vision of a cross, and he saw the words, in this sign, in this cross, we conquer. Um, and a later dream he would have of Jesus. He had his troop then mark their shields with the Christian symbol of Cairo, which is a symbol both of the cross and the first two letters of Christos. Uh, he, fat, he fought Maxentius at the Milvian Bridge, which led to the capital, and the forces of Maxentius were forced backwards to the Tiber River, and he himself drowned while escaping. So Constantine became the emperor of the West, and in 324, he defeated the East Emperor Licinius and took control of the entire Roman Empire, and he, can, he came to support the church, and he viewed his reign not just as a victory for Rome, but a victory for Christ. So, 
In 310, he claims on his way into battle to have a vision. He's on his way to war. He's with his army. Unexpectedly, he witnesses a complex halo phenomenon. He sees a double ring halo, each ring with three mock suns arranged in a cross formation around the sun. Tangent arcs and points of intersection within the circle, presumably with a more or less distinct light cross in the middle. And he saw it in the spring and in the afternoon, which is when the phenomenon mainly occurs. A cross of light in the sky encircled by a crown. For the fourth century Christians, however, this could be anything other than the sign of of the cross. So Constantine claims conversion, and many believe, wow, ain't that convenient. At this period of time, Christians are being martyred. The martyrdom is not slowing down Christianity. Constantine is about to go to war in an impossible battle. Constantine has seen the power of the Christian God. Constantine is a religious man. He, Constantine has seen and was raised in a supernatural environment. And on his way to an impossible war, he claims to look up and have a vision of the cross. And he claims to have heard God tell him, if you will fight with this sign of the cross, this cross will lead you to victory. This... <laughs> This has been a frustrating study, okay, uh, tonight. Not, I, I've been loving this whole study. But the reason why Constantine is such a frustrating study is that everybody hates him. In fact, <laughs> not, you, not you guys, but one source that I was studying on the life of Constantine, literally every statement was dishonoring and disgracing Constantine. Every he claimed he had a, a, he saw the cross. He did not see the cross. This was a demonic man of, you know, he claimed, no, uh, he was, you know. And I'll tell you what, okay, I'm not one to blame white evangelicals for stuff. Usually I'm being called a white evangelical. Yes, identify as white. But I will, I don't necessarily think of myself as an evangelical. I think of myself as a holy ruler. Okay, anyway. Um, <laughs> I identify as a white holy ruler. Okay, good. I, let me just say this. That white evangelicals for the last 20 years have been on this anti-Constantine trip to the point I was at a pastor's meeting just about two years ago. Uh, a good pastor, but he was on this study with his church where he's trying to convince his church that they shouldn't go by the title Christian anymore because Christian goes back to Constantine. So it's like, what are you going to call yourself? And now they've got to start having a bunch of crazy conversations about what title we're going to, we're going to you know. And, and sometimes we waste so much time on, on weirdo semantics, okay? And, uh, but I'm telling you, this is, this is, this is, this is real. In fact, um, you know, as we're going to see here in a second, Constantine was responsible for a lot of different things. But what happens is, is that when you've got somebody that, that, that screwed a lot of stuff up, sometimes what we want to do is throw out the baby with the bathwater. We want nothing to do with any of it, okay? And in doing so, we oftentimes isolate ourselves and situate ourselves to where we can actually have no influence on anyone or anything because we don't trust anyone or anything. <laughs> You're like, well, at least I'm holy. Really? <laughs> Who told you that? TBN, right? Like, come on. Okay, when it comes to Constantine, did Constantine really have this encounter? Most people that I read would say, no. He just wanted to be on the winning team. Christianity was winning. His, his paganism wasn't winning. He was a pagan. Christianity was, was the main thing. And so he just, he wanted to be, he wanted to be on, the, on the winning team. He wanted to bet on the winning horse, so he bet on Christianity. The, okay, the problem with that is that at this time, upon his conversion, only 5 to 10% of the Roman Empire claimed Christianity as their, as their faith. So if only 5 to 
of your empire is claiming something, I don't think that's enough to fake a conversion. So I personally believe that he had some sort of encounter. I, I personally believe that what he saw, okay, was, was probably from God, and, 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 and God trying to get his attention. And here's the other thing, that even though there's a, the, the Constantine was, was, was a, was, was, had some issues, okay, God actually used him. God actually used him, and we have some incredible pillars within our faith because of this guy who may or may not have been converted, and because of this guy that probably had a legitimate encounter that just didn't lead to a full transformation of life. And, and we all know that story, and that story's all throughout the Bible, and that story's all throughout church history. People that say, if God would do this, I would believe in him, and I would never deny him. Oh, really? You guys, there were people that watched Jesus after his death and resurrection. It says, and they watched him ascend up into the clouds. Right? They watched him ascend and disappear. And you know what it says? Some worshipped. And yet others doubt it. Yeah, when people tell me, if God would do this, then I believe in him. <laughs> you know what I tell them? No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. You're trying to make some stupid ultimatum that, 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 if, God will, that if God will pretend for a second that you are God, then you will believe that he is God. I call your bluff. So did Constantine have an encounter? No, we don't know. We don't know. But I think, I think that he probably did have a legit encounter that, that did not lead to fullness of transformation. One of the things that uh, Constantine is known for is the Edict of Milan. And we see it, this in uh, February of 313 AD. There's an agreement to a, uh, uh, to a, big group of Christian leaders that come together. And in this edict of 313, this is the official end of Christian, persecu uh, Christian persecution in the Roman Empire. The edict of Milan gave Christianity legal status um, that, uh, that made it appropriate that Christians could be citizens within the Roman Empire. This was the end of Christian persecution from the Romans, okay? Um, this was not full integration of Christianity into politics yet, but it was the beginning um, of integration that would be coming, okay? The problem was that uh, with this integ uh, integration of, of the acceptance of Christians into Roman culture, now you have a pagan, a predominantly pagan culture that is now letting the Christians in. And with Constantine's conversion, if you will, he wanted to see a united Rome. So it was his heart that in order to have a united Rome, there had to be a celebration and acceptance of Christianity and paganism. Now, and that's, that's bad, okay? Now, here's the thing. <laughs> here's, 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 here's the thing. Uh, the longer that Constantine was a Christian, the more he would purge paganism from the, emperor, from the empire. So you see this guy that claims conversion says, no more persecution of the Christians. You are accepted, but now we're going to accept Christianity and paganism, and we're going to celebrate the two. However, even though he would begin to purge paganism from the culture, he ne there was never a complete um, denying of paganism. There were always these subtle pagan practices that, would remain in the culture um, and would eventually be accepted and celebrated by the church. Now, during this time, remember where we started. What was Christianity? It, it was at the Seton's house eating pizza. Okay, that's what we, that, that's what we did. This, this is our roots. 
We go to temple, okay? The reading of the Torah, right? Um, yeah, and then, you know, this, it began to grow. We, we see, like, you know, Gentiles become a part of this whole thing, and, um, and, and their, their diets change. There's, there's fights over that, and a lot of weird talk about circumcision. Things got really messy. You read the book of Acts, things get really messy. Doesn't matter. It still always took place in each other's homes. Temple by day, homes at night, okay? And in the book of Acts, they'd even go door to door to talk to people that weren't even a part of their faith. So they would go door to door and they would, they would do what? They would do signs, wonders, miracles, preach Jesus the Christ, and, and people would be added. And so these guys were very inclusive. But all of a sudden, you guys, for the very first time in church history, what had always taken place in people's homes, all of a sudden we see buildings. Church buildings. Big, big buildings. By AD 323, we begin to see state-constructed church projects. The church that always met in homes began meeting in elaborate buildings with high, high, high ceilings. And with the size of these buildings came gigantic congregations where hundreds of people would begin gathering in attendance. And for the very first time, what was once a bunch of people at the Setons at a table where everybody gets to talk. <laughs> everybody gets to talk. For the very first time in church history, what was intimate, what was family, now became a concert. <laughs> where the people of God who were sons and daughters, who had dignity and revelation and a voice, now became sheep. Sheep that should attend a weekly meeting and shut up. Huge, elaborate pulpits would be built. During this time was the invention of the pulpit. And not just a pulpit. I'm up about, I don't know, two and a half feet. How many of you have ever been to Europe, you know, been to Rome, and seen these pulpits that are like, they're like way, way, way up in the air. For the very first time, a speaker <laughs> would speak a speech, and they were a professional speaker replacing any sort of spontaneity in the church. All of a sudden, we've got church government that was being formed and framed by Roman government. So the Roman rules for holding a meeting would now present the quorum or the agenda for how the church would gather. It is during this time that the derogatory C word that was used for followers of the way, right? In, in, the, in the book of Acts, it says that, 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 that they were followers. Oh, you're part of that group. You're part of that fringe group. You're part of that cult. You're, you're a follower of the way. Meaning that here you have a people and they're doing life according to a different way. People that hated these people called them the C word. This was a derogatory word, Christian, meaning a Christ copycat or a Christ clone. You're just trying to be, you're just trying to be a Christian. You're a Christian. You little Christ. You think you're Jesus. <laughs> this was like a derogatory, this was like a mean word. And now this became the title for Christians. So what do we have during this time? We have the origin of clergy. We have the origin of pulpits, of church stages, of choirs, of the, of, of, of the celebration or the state-recognized day of Sunday, being the day named after the sun god, Sol, being the day that Christians would gather. We'll get into that here in a second. We'll get into all this here in a second. Dressing up. 
to go to church. It came during this, during this time. Easter, during this time. The word Christian. And eventually government-controlled religion. The word clergy is interesting. Why? Uh, the word clergy is referring to a religious clerk. It's a term that originally described pagan priest. All of a sudden, we've got the word for pagan priest being put on pastors. And all of a sudden with this, clergy start wearing really silly Halloween costumes that would, that would separate them from the common person. So this is how you dress now look at how I dress. I will wear this really big, ornate garment that separates me from you. Why? Because I am better than you. This, this, it, this is this whole place of the separation of clergy from the laity, something that Martin Luther would battle years later through the doctrine of the priesthood of believers. Here's the thing. I was going to come up with, I was going to show you a bunch of the original paintings and slides of this stuff. But I realized, I didn't want, a lot of these paintings and slides are actually really, really evil. Why? Because they're all, <laughs> they're all pagan. So I decided to spare you from putting up a bunch of pagan art <laughs> up on, on the screen. Okay, choirs. Choirs were originally a pagan practice. Why? We see the early church in Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians uh, uh, 3.16 that the early believers would sing together, and they would sing spiritual psalms, and they would speak to, to one another in these psalms, and that worship was a communal practice. It was something there. The, the, the people of God would come together, and they would sing together, but during this time, the, the cults would do things differently. They would have groups of people that would be selected that would work on enter, entertaining or, 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 uh, or choreographed chanting where they would dress up in various robes and they would do these these mantra like portal opening incantations that would open up realms and so in order to honor the the people that were coming out of these pagan religions where, th where this was practiced we see some things that were taken from paganism to the point where by 8500, by the time that Pope Gregory is around, um, singing, it was kind of like um, Washington State um, in 2020. Congregational singing was illegal. But it wasn't because of the science. Okay. <laughs> the choir would sing... Okay, or the priest would sing, but the people would remain silent. We see Sunday, the day of the sun. Uh, uh, we see that this was a, uh, a holiday reserved once a week for the sun worship. We see that Constantine builds during this time not just Christian temples, but the government also begins building a number of pagan temples as well, even in uh, 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 Constant Constantinople, is that, is that right? Uh, even there, in a city dedicated to Christianity, Constantine would pay for pagan temples to be erected in a city that was dedicated to Christ and for his worship. It is during this time that the spiritual gifts would begin to disappear in the body of Christ being relegated only to clergy, only to priests. We see during this time with the Council of Nicaea, the, this is the first Council of Nicaea, uh, Christian bishops convened um, in Nicaea, this is 8325. During this time, the, the accomplishments um, uh, during this time was they came up with the Nicene Creed. They also mandated the, observant, the observance of the date of Easter, um, as well as uh, the promotion of the canon law. Um, Easter is interesting. Um, during this time, the Nicene Creed said this will be the official date of Easter, 
a time when we remember the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. But in English-speaking countries, also in Germany, Easter takes its name from the pagan goddess from the Anglo-Saxon England, who is described in a book in the 8th century English monk, um, it comes from the word Yoster. Yoster was a goddess of spring or renewal, and that's why her feast is attached to the vernal equinox. Um, in Germany, the festival is called Ostern, and the goddess is called Ostera. And we could go on and on with rabbits, you know, symbolic of fertility because they breed like rabbits. <laughs> um, I could explain more on that on my YouTube channel. Also, we see the whole thing of Easter eggs, which is also uh, comes from paganism. It's a celebration of um, fertility. It's the goddess of fertility. You know, so we might as well just, you know, put it all together <laughs> with the resurrection of Jesus. That makes perfect sense. Okay. With the Council of Nicaea, Constantine is called upon the council, largely as a means, he inserts himself to a certain degree because of concerns of disunity within the Roman Empire. They see that different waves of heresy are taking place. There's disunity, there's all these different thoughts. And during this time, they come up with the Nicene Creed, and actually, believe it or not, during this time, there was this creed, and we'll show it to you at the end. Creed is amazing. It becomes the blueprint for Orthodox Christianity. Um, so again, that's, it's, it's amazing. We'll, we'll, I'll read it here at the end. Nicene Creed, awesome. What wasn't so awesome is that anybody that would not sign on the line, saying that they adhere to that, um, that they would begin going through Christian Persecution. So for the very first time, we see now Christians persecuting Christians. Thank God that doesn't happen anymore. All right. <laughs> A couple of things. Oftentimes people say, I hate Constantine. He was the worst thing ever. Why? Constantine forced people to convert to Christianity. This is mostly false. Constantine eventually banned a movement that, um, uh, uh, where they were forcing this movement to convert to mainstream Christianity. But a lot of these people that they were forcing during this time already considered themselves as Christians. Outside of one particular movement that Constantine was worried about and did suffer persecution there, outside of this movement, Constantine... Uh, there's actually zero evidence that he ever forced non-Christians, whether Jews or pagans, to convert to Christianity. In fact, upon his defeat of uh, Lysianus, hopefully I said that right, no I didn't, in 324, this is from Constantine himself. This is a quote. My own desire is for the common good of the world and the advantage of all mankind that thy people should enjoy a life of peace and undisturbed concord. Let those, therefore, who still delight in error be made welcome to the same degree of peace and tranquility which they have who believe. For it may be that this restoration of equal privileges to all will prevail to lead them into the straight path. Let no one molest one another, but let everyone do as his soul desires. Only let men of sound judgment be assured of this, that those only can live a life of holiness and purity, whom thou callest to a reliance on thy holy laws. With regard to those who hold themselves aloof from us, let them have, if they please, their temple of lies. We have the glorious edifice of thy truth, which thou hast given us our native home. We pray, however, that they too may receive the same blessing and thus experience the heartfelt joy which unity and sentiment inspires. Let's talk about Sunday. Did Constantine change the worship day for the New Testament believers? Okay, um, we actually see in 119 
I'm sorry, in A.D. 117, which is before the conversion of Constantine, Ignatius writes, If then those who had lived in antiquated practices came to the newness of hope, no longer keeping the Sabbath, but living in accordance with the Lord's day, on which our life also arose through him and to his death. What does this tell us? That in 117, 117 years after the death of Christ, and before the conversion of Christ, early church fathers were practicing worship to Jesus the Christ, but not on Saturday, okay? Not on Sabbath, but on the day that we would call Sunday. In the epistle of Barnabas, second century, this is before the conversion of Constantine, um, it says this, we spend the eighth day, that would be the day that we call Sunday, in celebration, the day on which Jesus both arose from the dead after appearing again and ascending into heaven. A.D. 155, again, before the conversion of Constantine, Justin Martyr. This is what he says. And on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities and the country gather together in one place. But Sunday is the day on which we all hold our common assembly because it is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world and Jesus Christ, our Savior, on the same day, rose from the dead. So there are some who hated the Jewish people, changed it to Sunday. It was because of, he was an anti-Semite who wanted to completely destroy the Hebrew narrative within the church. And so if you really want to worship Jesus, you can't worship him on Sunday. Jesus will not be worshipped on Sunday. He has to be worshipped on Saturday. And if you're not worshipping on Saturday, you're deceived. Yeah, no, it wasn't because of Constantine. We see that the early church fathers were, and um, hey, by the way, when Sabbath? Every day. Right, 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 right. Because right. what, was, what was Saturday? It was the shadow Sabbath. And then who opened up Sabbath to every day? Jesus. He said, I am the Sabbath. You want rest? You don't need a day of the week. You need a lifestyle of Christ Jesus, a lifestyle of stuff. And if you're a part of the origin series, what's rest? Not Netflix and a good couch. Although nothing wrong with that, okay? If you ask me. No, but that's not rest. I don't know about you. Netflix and a good couch, I don't necessarily feel rested. What's rest? Okay, rest, Sabbath means to return back to the seat. What's rest? Rest is when we sit down in our throne and we rule and reign with Christ Jesus in heavenly places. Kings don't fret. Kings don't strive. So when we participate with our kingship authority, that's when we're at our best. We're at our best when we're at kingly rest. That's going to be a YouTube clip. Okay, next one. Um, <laughs> Constantine was not the inventor of Christmas. Some of you might, may have heard this before, that Constantine came up with the, the pagan holiday that would become known as Christmas, and I, you know, the church father, Hippolytus, in AD 1, 1, 180 to 220, somewhere there, he calculated the date based off of his notions about the date that God created the heavens and the earth. This church father decided Jesus had to have been born on December 25th. This is like those guys that write books on when Jesus is coming back. You know? And, 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 and they have no idea. And they make tons of money. They make tons of money on these books. I was, did you hear? Ah, Jesus, come back. And, you know, ah. Yeah, anyone that, that writes a book on the day that Jesus come back, or even, even the year, okay, um, they don't know. They don't know. And um, it's kind of like this guy. You know, he, he came up with the exact day that Jesus was born, December 25th, okay? Many disagreed. <laughs> but by the late third century, much of the church was opting for December. And they just thought, hey, what the heck, December 25th, okay? And they were wrong, and now and most people agree that they were wrong. But hey, December 25th, we get like a month off of work, so hallelujah, amen? 
So you could blame Hippolytus, not Constantine. Constantine had nothing to do with what books went in the Bible. For any of you, what Dan Brown, uh, I, 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 would, I would suspect that there are actually no Dan Brown fans here. And if there are, um, you can get saved here in just a sec. I'll, 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 we'll, we'll, do, we'll, we'll do an altar call. Um, that'd be like the, the Da Vinci Code and that whole series of crap. Um, so anyways, he came up with this whole thing that it was Constantine that actually got to determine what books were going to be in the Bible and then burned all these, burned all these other books. The Gospels were already thought to be four in number, no more, no less, um, before the council in Nicaea. There were some books that were doubted even by the Christians, but the list that we have in our New Testament books today is very similar to the accepted books there even uh, uh, before the council of Nicaea. Constantine also did not invent the cross as the symbol for the church. Constantine invented the cross, okay, as a, uh, 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 this is what, what people say, that Constantine took the symbol of the cross from paganism. You will hear this from Jehovah Witnesses, among others, that claim that the cross is an ancient pagan symbol. Okay, is the cross an ancient pagan symbol? Yes. But they didn't come up with it. Pagans have never invented anything. Satan can't create anything. He's not a creator. He's just a perverter. Okay? Pagans also claim circles to be their shape. They also claim triangles to be their shape. They also claim the swastika to be their shape. So pagans, they just basically say, everything is ours. And what do Christians say? Okay, that means everything has a demon. Oh, oh, it's a demon. My daughter asked me, she, rabbit trail, we got time. My daughter said to me, can objects have a demon? I said, yeah, they can. Witches will put curses. This is my little, this is my Sophia. She's something years old. She's cute. Anyways, um, Eight. In case you're wondering, she's my eight. <laughs> I hate it when parents at my kids' school are like, and how old are you kids? And I was like, you're, you're, you're. okay, anyways, so be is eight. <laughs> and um, I said, yes, yes, objects can, have a, objects can have a demon. Oftentimes, witches will curse sticks and rocks. Uh, it's so cute. They, they do it here on our property. They, um, they, put, they put sticks and stuff on our property. They, they'll pile them up and they'll do stuff with rocks and stuff. And they, they think that can affect us, you know, because, because they're naive. But I said, but guess what else? Objects can also have the Holy Ghost. I said, you know, the Apostle Paul would take handkerchiefs. And, and, and the apostles would anoint handkerchiefs and they would send them out and they would, they would bless people. And, 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 and here's the other thing, that if you're a Christian, you don't have to be afraid of demons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. Because greater is he who is in us than he who is in In fact, Paul would say this. Paul would say, can a Christian eat meat that's been offered to demons? And you know what Paul says? Yep. In fact, you even get like 20% off. So it's a good way to get cheap meat to feed a lot of people. Why? Because we already learned the apostles were really into lots of food and feeding lots of people. And they did not have a lot of money. So here we see that the church had many different symbols that began during the early church, and these symbols were a way to identify themselves as Christians. In fact, the fish was one of their symbols, and, 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 and they didn't know if they could trust, you know, if you trust the wrong person, that would get you killed. And they would literally um, use their foot to engrave in the sand half of a fish. And if you were a believer, you would take your foot in the sand and finish, uh, and finish the, uh, the fish. But also, there are... Um, examples within these Roman uh, catacombs of the cross that exist, you'll see it here on the left, that exist 
before the conversion of Constantine. My, my point is this. Constantine did a lot of things that have affected our faith. Okay? But there are also a lot of things that are put on Constantine that were already dramatic shifts within the church before Constantine. And this is why we're hitting on this. is because if, we, if, if, if I, I, I read a whole bunch of different sources and, and one person would say this and the other person would say this. And I'm talking about even sources who were alive when Constantine was alive. There's like five different accounts of his conversion all refuting each other. There's all of these different accounts and all of these different things. And, 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 and this is what my concern. My concern is white evangelicals. <laughs> They're the worst. I'm just kidding. That's what the media always says. I'm just having fun. <laughs> my, my concern is this. If we just want to say, oh, yuck. Look at what he did. He did big church. That's why I hate the church. The, the, now they're on pulpits and microphones and, 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 and they're just big concerts and, and, and God isn't in, in, in any of that. Here, here's what we're going to see, you guys. We're going to be reading uh, uh, stories and we're going to be looking at lives that existed during this time. We're going to be looking at people that adopted the Roman Catholic faith, but they loved Jesus. <laughs> we're going to look at people that believed in the holiness and divinity of Mary, and yet they loved Jesus and they loved the church. I don't like that. Tough. <laughs> God didn't ask my permission. He didn't ask your permission. And here's the thing, that God in his sovereignty used the very first converted Roman emperor to legalize the Christian religion and a lot of stuff changed for the worst. However, the largest missionary expansion in history began and by 300 AD we see 80% of the empire uh, declaring Christianity as their faith. You say, whoa, 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 maybe a lot of those were forced and maybe not all of those were real, but if you begin to look at the accounts of Christianity for the first 350 years, you will see radical, wild, supernaturals who I'm not going to point a finger at. Why? Because they were walking in signs, wonders, miracles, crazy exorcisms. They walked in authority over nature itself. They would change weather patterns. They would, they would literally uh, 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 go into town. There's a, there's a story of St. Francis of Assisi. We'll, we'll look at him. Who went into a town that was being oppressed by demon-possessed wolves and he led the wolves to the Lord and casted the demons out. Like We are going to look at people that if you've got a religious spirit you'll say, I cannot honor that. I cannot honor that because there's stuff that's, that offends me. But here's the thing. How many know that if you don't honor your mother and father, life's not going to go well for you? And how many of you had a perfect mother and father? Isn't this the biggest challenge? Isn't this, besides Haley, isn't, it the biggest, isn't this the biggest challenge for us that the enemy tries his darnest? Right when we're starting to come into adolescence and right when all of a sudden our filters are starting to go, we start to see the humanness of our parents. That the enemy shows up to do what? To sow seeds of dishonor. Why? Because that is his way of thwarting us to keep us from our inheritance. I believe that we have an inheritance as the church. And it is available through honor. And as we look at these, 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 these humans with issues, with imperfect theology... Let us be humbled into the reality that we likewise are humans with imperfect theology. I would love to share with you, and I have been sharing with you, my present theology. But can I tell you something? My theology is in progress, as am I. 
that I do not have perfect theology. I love Bill Johnson. He has perfect theology. <laughs> Bill says, Jesus is perfect theology. I'm in progress. You're in progress, but I'm hungry for more. <laughs> I'm hungry for the wild stuff. Why? Because we have a wild God. Our God is not... Our God is not tame. He's not predictable. He loves to do new things. He loves to do offensive things. I mean, he loves me, but he has no problem offending me. And I believe that as we go through this series, I believe that if we could really wrestle, if we could really wrestle through some of this, ah, I love what Danny Silk says. He says, to honor means to receive someone for who they are without rejecting them for who they're not. Amen. And as we go through these series, we will have opportunities to reject people because they trigger us in a massive, massive way. But if we can honor, I believe we can learn. We can receive. We can receive of anointings, yes. Okay? But we can also learn from lessons within our church history. Because how many of you know that we don't have to make mistakes that have already been made? If we will have the humility to honor, yeah, and learn from those who have ran before us. You are at where you're at tonight because of those who have run before you. Our country is at where it is at tonight because of those who have fought for our country. We are at where we are at tonight because of leaders who would take a stand. We are at where we get to talk about things tonight without having a bunch of picketers outside. Why? Because a generation went before us and they did that. They paved the way for us so that we have a freedom in the spirit to go after the more of God without any fear of, of, of pushback. That honor is what opens the door. Honor is where we find our reward. Honor is where we can begin to build off of what the last generation went after. And so, as a church, how do we do this? We come together for temple, and then we meet in our homes. And we say that food is a, an, a, an unofficial core value here at SRC. In fact, the only way to become a member here is we make you eat with us. And we sit at a table. It's next Sunday, next Sunday afternoon. We sit at tables. What do we do? We eat. And we don't just eat. But we eat with gladness. And we talk about what Jesus has done. We talk about what Jesus is doing. And then we dream together what do you think Jesus is going to do? You'll, you'll hear questions. They'll ask us questions about what have we seen Jesus do here at SRC? They'll, they'll, we'll be asked questions. What do we think Jesus is about to do? And we will begin to daydream together. We will begin to fantasize, a, a good fantasy. Not, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, we'll dream together. We'll, we'll talk. About, God told Bobby Connor, you have permission to exaggerate what I am about to do. We will dream together. We will talk about the things of God and we will honor those who have run before us. And in doing so, I believe a portal of opportunity will be opened so that we can step into something that we didn't even pay for. The Lord spoke to me one time before I was pastor and he said, you're not going to have to dig any holes because there's tunnels that have already been dug. I love the story of the prodigal son. I love the part where the older brother is having a pity party. He's out, you know, they're out, they're having a big party. They're doing karaoke. <laughs> older brother's outside. And what's he doing? And what does dad do? Dad runs outside and he says, son, they're playing your song. They're playing your song. School's out. For, and, the, 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 and the older brother is just sitting there. And the, and the older father says, what's, what's your deal? 
He said, Dad, I did everything right. I didn't, I didn't curse you to your face. I didn't say, I wish you were dead. I didn't, I didn't disgrace our family. I didn't take our family fortune and, and spend it on prostitutes. I didn't do any of that. But your full son did. That jack clown did. And then he came back. And you're throwing him a party? You even hired a DJ? You did all that for him. In my whole life, you haven't even given me a goat. And meanwhile, there's like a goat, and he's like, <laughs> you know, he wakes up, and he's like, what? What? <laughs> and what does the dad tell the older brother? He says, son, everything I have is already yours. You got the younger son that just says, Dad, I don't love you. I just want your stuff. I wish you were dead. Give me my money. And he takes it and he runs. And then you got the other son, the good son. And what does he say? Dad, I don't, I don't love you. I've been doing the right thing all these years, not because I love you, but, I, but because I just want your stuff. And you won't give me it. Uh. And here's a dad saying, I love both of you. I just wish you loved me. I love both of you and I, and I will bless you. I just wish that you would love me because I'm your dad and not because what I can give to you. This is what, this is what honor does. Honor says, I'm going to respect you. I'm going to do right by you, but not because I want anything from you. I'm going to respect you. I'm going to do right by you. I'm going to honor you because you're worthy of it. And when we look at various moves of God, moves of God that were wild, when we look at revivals and harvests that have taken place with, with, within the earth, there's going to be this place where we say, I can't receive from that because of this. I can't receive from that because of that. I can't receive from that because of that. I can't receive from you because of this. I can't receive from this person because of that. I can't receive from that. I, 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 hate, I hate that church because of that. I, I'll, I'll never listen to that, that pastor. Everything that church has ever done is, you know, I threw away all their albums the second I heard about that on CNN. I, I'm just completely done, done with that. And, 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 and this is what the Lord is saying is, are you willing to celebrate the testimony of Christ Jesus as it's been played out through imperfect people, imperfect places, imperfect institutions, imperfect moves that God was actually in? And if you're willing to celebrate Jesus and who He is, and as He's been reflected through imperfect human hands, as we honor, we can step in and we can continue a move in our generation. I want to dream from the well of Azusa. I want to drink through the well of Acts chapter 2. I want to drink from the well of John Alexander Dowie. I want to drink from the well of John G. Lake. I want to drink from the cup of Christ. I want to drink from these wells. And if these moves of God came from heaven, then that well stream is still alive and active. If these really were moves of God that came from heaven, then even if we don't see a reflection of these moves, that river is still flowing in the Spirit. That the same river that flowed into Azusa, that the same river that flowed through the country of Wales, that same river, if it really was from heaven, that same river is flowing. And it's flowing from the throne of grace. And we can access the river of life. And we can access this river that is flowing from His heart. If you want more of Him, His answer is everything I have is yours. You don't have to steal it. You don't have to perform for it. Everything I have is yours. Finally, a people who will love me for me. 
Finally, a generation who wants me for me. You are invited to come and drink from this river of life. You are invited to come and drink from this fountain. You are invited to come and drink from Christ Jesus himself. He is the answer for my life and yours. He is the answer to all of our problems. He is the answer for our country. He is the answer for Seattle. He is the answer for business. He is the answer for media. He's the answer for the marketplace. He's the answer for education. He's the answer for a generation that is hopped up on drugs and antidepressants and, and anxiety medication. Jesus is the answer. The river is the answer. Come and drink. Come and buy. Come and receive. Come. Come to the waters. Come to the waters. Come to the waters. You can stand. <laughs> hey, I pray that we wouldn't just be a generation of interrupters. I pray that we'd be a generation of innovators. I pray that we'd be a generation that just doesn't complain about stuff. I pray that we'd be a generation that solves problems. I pray that, 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 that we wouldn't even see crisis. All we would see is opportunity. And when we speak, we don't contribute to the problem. When we speak, we contribute to heaven coming. We, we just take a drink. Just take a big drink. Lay your hand on the person next to you. And just give him a drink right now. Just give him a drink of Jesus right now. Give him a drink from that well stream, from that river, from that Azusa River, from that Acts 2. From that Smith Wigglesworth River. From that Spokane, Washington, Healing Move River. From that resurrection power. Would you just would you just declare this over, over, over your neighbor right now? And would you mean it? Why don't you declare one word? More. Give him more. More, Lord. Give him more. Just declare it right now. Just say, give him more, Lord. <laughs> give him more. 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 Whoa. <laughs> give him more. Give him more. Give him more. Oh. <laughs> ah. Baptize us in the Holy Spirit. Baptize us in fire. Sha. Baptize us in the Holy Spirit. Baptize us in fire. Shh. Oh, sing it out. Baptize us in the Holy Spirit. Baptize us in fire. <sighs> Baptize us in the Holy Spirit. Baptize us in fire. Ooh. 
Baptize us in the Holy Spirit. Baptize us in fire. More, more. Baptize us in the Holy Spirit. Baptize us in fire. More, Lord. More, Lord. We want more, Lord. We want more, Lord. We want more, Lord. We want more, Lord. Shere Amasiria. Oh, Shere Amasa. More of you, Lord. More of you, King Jesus. Hey. Yeah, there it is. There it is. There it is. More, 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 more right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Bypassing every filter. Bypassing every obstacle. Bypassing every defeater. Hallelujah. Sneak in. Holy Spirit, sneak in right now. Sneak into those places, Lord. Sneak into those places, Lord. Sneak into those places, God. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. More, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. Revelation, 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 revelation. Innovation. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, eyes to see, eyes to see, eyes to see, ears to hear, ears to hear, ears to hear. Shirley, I'm on a da da I'm da 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 there it is. There it is. There it is. There it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, all things old pass away. Oh, all things old pass away. Take us higher, Lord. We bless the land, 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 we bless the land.
tonight just separation anxiety we are one 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 hey. yeah 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 make a joyful noise see the 
Send the sweet spring rains, and the sweet spring rains. Send the sweet spring rains, and the sweet spring rain. Rain down, rain down, rain down, rain down. Rain down, Send the sweet spring rain, the love We drink from the well of that 1948 latter rain revival. We drink from that well that broke out in North Battleford, Saskatchewan. We honor William Branham. We honor those teachers, those fathers, those mothers that opened up a realm. They opened up a place of revelation and miracles. A place of vision and faith. The understanding that Christ has given to the church, the office of the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, and the evangelist for the building up of the church. We honor that well, the latter rain revival. We honor the fathers and the mothers of that movement. We ask, O oh Lord, that it would rain again. Let it rain again. Let it rain again. The former and the latter rain together. Let it rain. Let it rain. Awaken the hearts of your people. Awaken our hearts. Awaken the hearts of this city. Awaken your church. Awaken your people. Rain down. Let our eyes see God. With these eyes, let us see you. With these eyes, let us see your cross. Let us see your hands. Let us see your feet. Let us see your side that was pierced. Let us see your eyes. Let us see your face, King Jesus. Let us see your throne. Open the mysteries, Lord. Open the mysteries, Lord. Invite us into the mystery of your presence. Lord. 
invite us into that mystic secret, which is Christ. Christ Jesus is the mystic secret. Consume us in your glory, Lord. Hold us in your glory, Lord. Capture us in your glory, Lord. Transform us in your glory, You are the prize. You are the prize. You, you, you. Every soul. And then many signs and wonders were performed through the hands of the apostles. William Branham, the latter rain movement was just a phenomenal move of God in the earth. And uh, Darren and Greg Daly and I were fortunate to go and talk to one of the last living um, elders of that move of God. And just the wonders, the wonderful things that the choirs that could be heard for five miles down the road. And that revival lasted from 1948, I believe, until about 1962, when William Branham stood up and said, this revival is over for this reason, that the people want the ways of God more than they want God himself. And the first time I heard that, I was actually leading, uh, I led prayer, uh, intercessory prayer here for about eight years down in the basement on Tuesday mornings. And we started praying against that. We said, God, not in this generation, not us as a people, not the people now. God, let that never happen again. Let that never happen again, that we would want your ways, we, we would want your delights, that we will, would want the goodies more than we would ever want you. Let that, that's something I think we need to tuck away uh, within our hearts that 
recently, just within the last several months, this thought came to me. I'm not going to say it was the Lord, but what would I do if God never answered another prayer for me? What would I do? Could I honestly say I still serve you, Lord? Could I honestly say that? I felt I could because I've experienced the Lord. I've experienced the goodness of God. I've experienced, and yet I have so much more to experience. That relationship is the mystery of God. It's Jesus. And that relationship is open to any, everyone and everyone. As we're going forward into revival or awakening or reformation or whatever you want to call it, it's only going to work if we're at attached to the head, right? There's, there is a, a place in the spirit that's open for all of us in the cleft of the rock. We can, we can come in tonight because he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. This is that time we don't ever want to say this generation wanted the works of God more than they wanted. Let that never happen. Let that never happen in this or any generation from now on. Let that never be said from this day forward. And so let's just pray tonight. Let's just, uh, Father, we just come into agreement and we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father. We ask you, number one, God, let that reverential fear of the Lord come upon us, that we would walk like Jesus, that said the fear of the Lord was his delight. Let that be our delight. Let us experience, let us live in, let us be surrounded by the fear of the Lord. We pray for the church, Lord, not just us, God, but the church, the ecclesia, God. We pray, Lord, that that would be just, just an outpouring of that, God. We say, Lord, uh, your, your word says, Jeremiah 24, 7, I will give them a heart to know me. And so, God, in the places in our hearts that we don't know you yet, give us, give us that knowing. Give us that understanding. We breathe you in, Jesus. Your breath is in us and around us. And we thank you, Lord. We just thank you, God, for what you're doing here. We thank you for revealing mysteries, revealing uh, sons, revealing times and seasons, revealing who you are to us in the earth at this time, God. We thank you that heaven is open. And Lord, we come because you've called us. You've called us. So we bless. We bless. We say, bless the Lord. Oh, my soul and all that is within me. We bless your holy name. We give you thanks. We give you honor. We give you glory. You said, Lord, if we seek you, we will find you. And so, Lord, we seek you. We seek you individually. We seek you together. We thank you, Father. We thank you now for the reverential fear of the Lord to be our portion as a people here in Newcastle. And that we declare that will be our delight. Our delight is the reverential fear of the Lord. Here's my heart, God. Here's my life, God. Yeah, thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Have an amazing evening, awesome week, and we'll see you next weekend.